Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ancient India Unveiled. We're your hosts, Lillian, Braulio, Charles, and Julia here today with today's news. Today, folks, we're going to start off with a little weather report. You never know if it's going to start raining cats and dogs, so come here with what our weather correspondents, Luca and Ben, have to say. Hi, I'm Luca Nowinski here for a special weather report. Here in India, a monsoon is in the forecast. Now, don't be alarmed because I have all the information you need to get through this time. For those of you who don't know, a monsoon is defined as a wind pattern that influences the climate and leads to wet and dry seasons. Unless you are new to India, you will know that a monsoon comes every single year, and that there's even a period of the year called monsoon season. Here's Benjamin Edmonds to tell you about what happens during a monsoon. During a monsoon, the air becomes hot in summer, allowing for it to rise higher into the atmosphere. The moist cold air from the winter in the southern hemisphere comes to fill the gap the hot air left, causing rainfall. Thank you, Benjamin. Going back to even ancient Indian times, monsoons have consistently destroyed crops and forced people to move to a different location. People often had to live in a camp with thousands of other people. Recently, this has become even more of a problem given the COVID-19 pandemic. It is very difficult to keep social distance at six feet apart when there are thousands of people crammed into a small place because of the monsoon. Above all, please make sure that you stay safe and dry. I'm Luca Nowinski signing off on our historic 100% accurate weather report. Big round of applause for our meteorologists. Now we'll be going to Mahendra Daro where our chief foreign correspondent, Olivia Lopez, will be interviewing archaeologist Carson Pavlov on the newest discovery there in Ancient Artifact. Let's go there now. We're here on what used to be Mohenjo-Daro, what was once the largest city of the Indus Valley civilization. Wait, we're recording already? Shh. Today, I'm going to interview archaeologist Joe King, who has extensive knowledge of Mohenjo-Daro artifacts. Yes, and she's not Joe King. I am a good archaeologist who has indeed done good archaeology. Oh boy. So, Joe, can you tell us about some of the artifacts here? Yes, I can. Do you like me to tell you about sculptures or toilets? Sculptures! Sculptures are fine. Sure. The Indus people use clay to make many figurines or statues of people or animals. One example was found in 1926. It is a figurine of a girl, about 10.3 centimeters tall. She has one hand on her hip and no feet or toes. This gives us a hint at what type of clothing the Indus people wore. Another statue shows us a man. It's seven inches high and made of stone. Notice his hair is tied with a band that hangs down to his back and also the powdered milk. We're unsure of who the sculpture represents. Wow, how interesting! You must love your job. Not really, my career's in ruins. Aw, <laughs> oh, come on, that was pretty hysterical. I should have been a doctor. Anyway, can you tell us of other things clay was used for? As I said before, clay was used a lot in Mohenjo-Daro, and one of the most prominent was seals. Seals were used by merchants in trade to identify their god and were engraved in some kind of human or animal. It's kind of a signature of brand name. For example, the unicorn seal is based on a fictional animal of the Indus Valley Civilization. It is an example of early fictional art. That's our clayology. Why me? Oh, I forgot to mention. The Indus people made intricate jewelry. We found them mainly in locations like the Great Bath, where people probably lost them. Some of the materials used to create jewelry were lapis lazuli, red carnelian, and agate stones. These were likely worn by women. How enticing! The Indus people sure like to make well-crafted things. Yeah, it was an Indus. I should have known. All right, our final question for the day is, what was one of the biggest discoveries made here? In 1920, 39 skeletons were found. It didn't seem very injured. Maybe a disease wiped them out. We still don't know. Wow, that's a lot of skeletons. Of course. We archaeologists have a good eye. That's it. I've had enough of your terrible puns. What do you think you are, a comedian? Stop ruining my interview! Hey, I'm not a comedian. I'm just Joe King, okay? 
Ah! Well, thanks for watching. I'm Joe King, signing off. I don't know if it was just me, but I learned a lot. Now don't go anywhere during this commercial break given to you by Allie and Claire. If you are watching this news channel, you are clearly looking for a rich Harappan home. Luckily for you, we are here. We can give you a higher than quality tour of our Harappan home in the surrounding town for free. Harappa is west of the Indus River. In 2600 BCE, Harappa turned into large city centers. How modern. Here in Harappa, we have defensive military structures, not that we have any attacks. We also have giant walls to defend against the armies of floods. In the cities, you may find granaries, dockyards, stock rooms, brick platforms, and best of all, public baths. Moving on, in this city, we have a very special object, so very rare that not even the ancient Egyptians had them. We had doors! In addition to the giant walls, we have drains to protect you from the floods. Did you know that Harappa had the first plumbing system ever? Well, I'm doing this commercial, so yes! These drains went under the streets, so you did not have to worry about stepping out of your house and into a puddle of refuse, unlike in ancient Rome. So unsanitary! Heading inside the houses, you can find a courtyard perfect for outdoor activities. Only the wealthy and the people in high caste status had these. Going over to the side wing of the estate, we have the well and the toilet! This masterpiece goes to the plumbing under the house, which goes to the drains under the street. Back through the courtyard to the other wing of the estate, we have a beautifully crafted staircase and a charming old-fashioned kitchen. Most Harappan homes had multiple stories, making for some very modern styles. Upstairs, we have another work area that can be used for play and a ladder up to the roof. But we'll back to that later. Over here we have a balcony, always made of wood. That gives it more stability. Further on, we have a bedroom with a luxury known to few. Well, guess. You guessed wrong. We have beds. Back to the ladder, on the roof is space for luxury. A space that you can do whatever you want with. Did you like your tour? Clearly, this is a city of the best, a home fit for an emperor. Please know that we are not responsible for the destruction of any homes. We are not confirming that the homes are still intact. Thank you. Welcome back, folks. Now, next up is a discussion panel called Is It Just? with your hosts, Brandon and Braulio. Welcome to our discussion panel segment, Is It Just? This week, we'll be talking about the caste system, a social class system originally from ancient India that divides people into groups based on the class their families are born into. There are four castes or classes, the Brahmins, Kshatras, Vaishas, and Sudras, all in the highest, lowest caste. People are put into them based on where they were born. So two people in the Brahmin caste will likely have Brahmin children. Overall, the system is based on what your family does or did. If your parents were bakers, for example, you would be a baker for the rest of your life as well. However, there is another caste, the Dalits. The Dalits are considered impure just because of their birth. Birth is a roll of the dice. Someone is just as likely to be born into a rich family than a poor one. With the caste system, we are now judging others based on their origin, which is impossible to protect or control, and you end up being judged for the rest of your life. That brings us to our question. Is this system just? Why did it come to be? And what can we do about it? We'll discuss all of this and more after this short break. The answer, no. People are judged by an arbitrary set of lines. People are separated for something they did or that they have no control over. People should treat everyone with respect and equality. Take a look at us today. Do you think that we should judge someone based on the color of their skin? If you say that we won't, then why do we have to judge people based on their wealth? The logic is clear. The rich and the poor shouldn't come together. Humans should. People are defined by boxes, by artificially made categories meant to divide us and give power over others for the wrong reasons. If you are still not convinced that the caste system is unjust, ask yourself this. What if it was you on the other side? 
The caste system and other social class systems of old separate people and judge people unfairly for no real reason. The world was a very different place back then, but its unfair standards and beliefs still continue today. If we wish to create a world peace, of peace, we must first start by eliminating these metaphorical walls between us and work together to make the world a better place. This has been Is It Just? Cast System Edition. Thank you for watching. Back to you. How fun was, how informative was that? Up next, some breaking news with Brandon and Claire. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. Today, we are going to be focusing on the caste system in India. There are four main castes, and one of those are subcastes we, that we will be focusing on today. It will be the fifth caste system, the Dalits. As we speak, there are 160 million people in India that are considered Dalits, or the untouchables. In the caste system, those are people who must not touch the upper castes and are considered subhuman. This is a tragic system that needs to stop, as people should not need to live in constant fear as they walk through the streets. In Hinduism, the Dalits are considered to be impure and evil because of their past lives. For them, life is very different. Dalits are people who were bartered from generations ago and were subjected to safe labor just from a roll of the dice. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that they were born under a person that was a dollar. Birth is something that we can control, but how we treat people is what we can control. If someone's status is seen as a weapon, then they will always be considered armed and harmful. For those of you still wondering, what, it, what if it is you on the other side? Today, we have a story on the life of a dollar. Imagine yourself in a Dalit's shoes, though you probably don't have any. You can't go to school out of the Dalit school, you can't go into a non-Dalit neighborhood, drink from a non-Dalit well, pray in a non-Dalit temple, or even get a reaction from the priest if it's a different Dalit or caste that does something bad to you. Your jobs are the worst of the worst, from cleaning animal carcasses off the streets, life-threatening cleaning of the sewers, to tanning and preparing hides for leather goods. Some dollars work for local landlords, and if they take a loan from their landlord and are unable to repay it, their children sometimes work as if they were slaves, doing too hard of work for no pay. Your level is the lowest, but this is how you have grown up. You didn't do anything bad, as you can remember. You did do something bad in your past life, though. You became a Dalit simply by being born to Dalit parents. Even though you grew up like this, it doesn't mean you like it. Your life is lived in fear. Fear of what would happen if you stepped one toe out of line. Few things change as you grow up. You must marry within your caste, work within your caste, and your children are also within your caste. Things stayed the same till 1950 when the untouchables were banned. Still, discrimination continued until 1989 when India passed the Prevention of Atrocities Act. Thank you for watching our show, The Caste System in India. Well, wasn't that breaking news breaking? Next up, we have the trivia game show, Is It Hinduism or Buddhism? with a spectacularly grand prize. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, what you have all been waiting for, the latest installment of Is It Hinduism or Buddhism? The thrilling game show all about two popular religions. Join me, your host, Allie Marks, and our contestants, Braulio, Tegan, and Julia, in an intense battle of wits for the grand prize of an exclusive interview with Buddha himself. Let's talk to them right now. Braulio, how are you feeling? I'm okay, I guess. Great, Julia, what about you? I am amazing, as always. Okay, and Tegan? I'm good. Wonderful, now let's get started. As you might have guessed, the contestants will be answering questions about the age-old religions, Buddhism and Hinduism. They can answer with Buddhism, Hinduism, or both. Unless it's a true or false question. If they get the question correct, they will get a point. But if they get the question wrong, they will not gain anything. Now, is it Hinduism or Buddhism? For the first question, which religion has Sanskrit as their written language? Braulio, what was your answer? I said Hinduism. Copycat. Okay, so I assume your answer was Hinduism too? 
Duh. Hinduism. If you said Hinduism, you are correct. Yes, perfect as always. Yeah. Okay, on to the next question. In which religion is Buddha seen as a teacher? Tegan, what did you say? I said both. I said Hinduism. I think. What is Buddhism? Julia continues her streak with the correct answer. Nice. Oh, man. On to the next question. Which religion includes the caste system? Julia? Hinduism. 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 Both? Both. The correct answer is Hinduism. Before we continue, a quick message from the Harappan homes industry. Be smart, get modern luxury, and buy a Harappan home. Supply runs out quickly. Next question, which religion is polytheistic? Braulio? Hinduism. 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 An all-around hit for this one. Now, which religion acknowledges Buddha? Tegan? Buddhism. I asked Tegan, but okay. Uh, Tegan. Both. What Tegan say? The answer is both. What? Yes, you aren't so perfect, are you? Next question. True or false? Both religions share the ideas of karma, dharma, and samsara. All together, one, two, Three. True. true. Julia's having some trouble because the answer was true. Oh my gosh, this game is rigged. Hey, anyway, the next question is, Buddhism is mostly found in East Asia. True or false? False. 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 Is Julia rubbing off on you guys? The answer was true. Well, on to the next question. But before that, another message from the Harappan Homes industry. In Harappan Homes, we use all of the newest technology to ensure you the oldest comforts. Question number next, which religion uses statues? Julia, got your strength back? Of course. I'm going to go with both. Each you. Buddhism? Julia might have some luck yet because the answer was both. Yes. Next, Buddhism has Pali as their written language. True or false? Braulio, you're up. True. False. True. The true. answer was true. Which of the religions is older? Tegan? Buddhism? Buddhism. Buddhism. Hinduism. Buddhism is incorrect. Julia gets a point. Next question. What religion believes that a cycle of reincarnation can be broken? Braulio. Both. Buddhism. Answers across the board, but the answer was both. Next up, in which religion are cows sacred? Julia? Hinduism. Both. Hinduism. Hinduism. Hinduism was the correct answer. All right, second to last question. Which religion was founded by a single person? Tegan? 
Buddhism? I said both. Buddhism. And the answer was Buddhism. Okay, we are down to the last question. The first person to answer correctly wins the game. Why would we do all those other questions? I'm the one asking the questions around here. For your final question, why did the chicken cross the playground? Wait, what? To get to the other slide. Julia answers correctly and wins the game. Woohoo! I did it. I won. I did it. I won. You lost. I won. Julia wins an exclusive interview with Buddha at the end of this news program. Congratulations and thank you to all of our contestants who participated. Even though the game was rigged. What was that? Before we sign off, one last message. In her Robin Homes, you get the best of both styles, modern and ancient. Buy one now. This has been fun. Thanks for tuning in for Is It Hinduism or Buddhism? Well, that certainly put the trivia in game show. Next up is a commercial break with the Brandon and Olivia. Sit tight and don't go anywhere. Imagine India now. It is a cultural masterpiece and stepping stone for many subjects such as mathematics, literature, science, biology, economics, and education. Now you may see just a moment, but here is a very fine place of education of history's greatest scars. Let's discover ancient India at its finest, 1700 years ago. Let us jump back and see history with our own eyes and see the achievements of India of this university. One of ancient India's greatest academic achievements is the invention of algebra and the number zero. These are key fundamentals in things such as computer science, chemistry, physics, biology, accounting, economics, and meteorology. They are also the foundations of higher level math, such as vector spaces, linear algebra, step theory, and topology. Finally, we see the invention of calculus, which is very important as it holds as a placeholder for many fields. Not to mention accounting. Accounting is a highly important field in both business and economics. We have single-handedly invented books, making this one of the finest schools in all of history. 1700 years ago, you never thought that one of history's most important discoveries would take place here. That place was ancient India. From the first class 300 AD to the day, apply to the University of Nalanda and receive the education that history's finest scholars had for many years. All of these achievements stem from the Gupta Empire increasing access to education and helping them build colleges and universities all around India. So what are you waiting for? Let's make history by applying to Lambda University today. Up next, we have an interview. So please welcome Julia Ting Krishna. Wow, I can't believe I'm meeting Buddha. What a great prize. I wonder where he is. Oh, Mr. Buddha? Just Buddha. Mister makes me feel old. Sorry, um, could I maybe ask you some questions? Of course, fire away. Well, my first question is, when were you born? Never ask the Buddha's age, but if you really must know, 563 or 480 BCE. No, what? I am old. When did you die? I think uh, 400 or 483 BCE. Yeah. Can't remember exactly, though. I think I died of food poisoning. Gods get food poisoning? not a god. You need to know this concept. I am no god, only a teacher seeking to help others. So why did you form Buddhism? I thought that we needed a middle ground between extremes and I wanted to stop suffering, which I saw a lot. What a great reason. Does Buddhism use castes? 
No, of course not. Buddhism believes that all humans are equal. Did you just cringe? Yeah. Do not like the name Buddhism. It implies that my students are going on my viewpoint, not objectively. I see. Uh, does your religion worship a god? No, we do not believe in a god. We believe that we should not worship any supreme deity, not even me. Sorry to cut this interrogation short, but I'm fading back to the realm of nirvana, everlasting peace, and the goal of every Buddhist. Got to go. Bye, human. Wait, but aren't you human too, Buddha? That is all for today. I hope you learned something. I know I did. Thanks for watching Ancient India Unveiled, and have a great day. Stay safe out there.